I'm Sergey. So today I'm going to talk about a uh, bachelor thesis, one of the bachelor thesis submitted to Yerevan State University. So basically, it's not my bachelor thesis, rather students who applied for this topic for GitHub Club. So short, first, initially, I'm going to talk about shortly about GitHub Club. What is it about? Then I'm going to talk about shortly about basic operations in CNNs, convolutional neural networks. And then exactly to the topic, which is detecting vehicles from satellite images, which was a bachelor thesis submitted by Armand Munatsakanyan, and I was supervising this topic. So the Gita Club is a platform which is enabling students and uh, supervisors to get together. So basically, if you are a student and you didn't find any interesting topic at your university or faculty, you will go to GitHub Club and find some submitted topics. And the supervisors are ex experts or just practitioners in their fields who, does not, who don't need to necessarily be from the university. So you can work in machine learning topic, and you can be a machine learning engineer, and you have some field of research you want to understand. You write a short description of your topic, you submit to GitHub Club, and the students will see, and they can apply to your topic, and if there is a match, then the GitHub Club organizes the submission process to university, so they can communicate with uh, faculty, and faculty accepts this topic, then you can write, or a student can write a bachelor thesis, which have been uh, provided from outsider, so non-university person. Uh, now I'm going to talk about, talk about the convolution process. So first, to understand, so basically on the top we see a convolutional neural network, which is consisting mainly of activation, uh, convolutional layer, max pulling, and activation layers. And I would like to give a short intro about convolution layer, a convolution filter, uh, convolution layer, which is somehow will bring you to understand uh, what is actually deep learning. So first, you have a kernel, uh, which has some parameters. And those parameters are uh, being tuned and adapted during the learning process. So basically, your convolution in your network during the training process adapts those weights. And what is a convolution? It is a kernel linear combination over the patch and uh, of the input image. and the kernel, and the, after linear com uh, when you calculate the linear combination, you replace n times n image patch with one. So basically, you calculate the linear combination and aggregate the information and uh, provide this to the next layer. I'm currently not talking about activation of maximum layers. And the thing is that the convolutional filter of the next layer is going to run uh, on already aggregated information, which is if I run over this image area or this pixel, this has been already three times three pixels from previous layer. So basically, this whole information is packed into this one. In the next layer, this uh, yellow area will pack in the one pixel. So basically, if I look through this one activation here, I would have a field of view of five times five given the fact that I have a filter of three times three. So what is happening? That means each and every next layer uh, sliding over an image patch, which uh, where, where each pixel has been a separate image patch in the previous layer. So basically, I'm aggregating context information. That means in initial layers, I'm going to detect maybe vertical or horizontal or vertical edges. In the next layer, I'm going more to take the combination of those. So the deeper I go, the higher is the abstraction information and the stronger semantic information I'm going to detect. The thing is, which is increasing the receptacle. So the thing is, this increase, uh, uh, to get it larger, to have a greater receptor field, you need to have a lot of layers. More layers, more parameters, which might free, uh, lead to overfitting the network. So how to come to address this issue? One of the approaches is uh, to use max pulling layers. 
So this max point layer is a filter which is running over the image. Usually it is a filter of two times two and the step of two, which is running, sliding over the image and picking up um, from every page uh, uh, an active, uh, activation with the highest intensity. So from this, I'm going to take the six from the other one eight, and I'm going to have a smaller activation map, but which is containing for me, let's say the relevant information. I lose some information, yes, I lose the rest three, but I am, uh, uh, I am but reducing the uh, activation map twice in each dimension. So basically this is good for computational costs because I'm reducing the activation map, but at the same time, I am increasing uh, uh, the context information. So basically to understand, if you are in a museum and you are in front of a painting, like if you just stay directly in front of a painting, maybe 30 centimeters above, you won't understand what is it. You might slide your head over a painting to understand what is it. But what you usually do, you take a step back and understand what you see here. So basically, in order to have uh, the view of the object or the scenery at once. Or if I would like to ask you, hey, <clears throat> if I would point a hand in front of you and ask what you see in front of you, and you don't know what is, what is in front of the kind of object in front of you, instead of sliding your head over the mobile phone, which you are not aware a priori what is it, you do like this, take a step back, and to, have, to see the object at once. So this is basically one of the uh, features of max pooling layers that I'm going to talk about later. Uh, so what you see here is actually, this is a, a convolutional neural network uh, uh, receptive field with, uh, with low receptive field and greater receptive field. Why it is important? Because if we have a, if we fit to the network, to the decision maker, what is depicted here for the network, it would be easier to understand what is depicted here when it sees the whole object with the context information, rather than see a small rectangle which is covering part of a car. So this is the importance of receptive field and, uh, and also uh, maximum layers and convolution layers. So now I'm going to talk about the topic, which is to detect vehicles uh, from satellite data, uh, from satellite. So basically we have 32,000 labels, labeled vehicles. And the images are done, uh, captured from six distinct locations. And the resolution at ground is uh, one pixel for 15 centimeters. So basically every uh, pixel are, is a 15 centimeter uh, in the real world. So basically if my car has the length on average three meters, then I will see the cars in the image. Uh, my cars will have uh, dimensions of 20 times 20 pixels in the images. Uh, we split it, the data into first validation, test, and train set. And we made sure that our validation test data has variation in locations. And the image resolution varies from 2K to 18K. Uh, and I'm going to show what kind of problems we faced. Um, the thing is the images are large and we cannot fit uh, a, an image of size 18,000 times 18,000 pixels into a network. So what we basically do, we just uh, slide over the image. We pick 1,000 times 1,000 patches and feed this to a network. There is one thing uh, to understand is that uh, uh, the step is 800 pixels. So basically I make sure that I have my current and the previous patch has overlap of 200 pixels so that we don't miss the cars on the borders of two patches. And one thing, this has been done by a student, bachelor student, and he was 20, 20, years, 20 years old. So he had made research, so what I'm presenting you is submitted by a student. So I was just supervising and giving some suggestions. So we decided to use RetinaNet architecture. Why? Because those are ought to be good in detecting small objects. As I've told, our objects are, has the size of 20 times 20 pixels. And we need 
to have a network which is, or meta architecture, which is capable of uh, dealing with small objects. In the previous slide, I talked about MOX preliminaries when I was saying I'm reducing the image resolution or activation map. The thing is, if the object initially has a size of 20 pixels, after five layers, it will be a four, four pixels. So it will be hard for the network from the last layer to localize the object and detect it. That is why we decided for RetinaNet, and now I'm going to explain what is behind it. Behind the RetinaNet is the feature pyramid network architecture. Uh, so basically, if you can see, this is a bottom-up flow where we feed an image, aggregate or extract features, aggregate information by running convolution and max preliminaries, and then in the end, our image will be much smaller than the initial size. But the smaller objects are going to be small. So it will be complicated for us to run detection over a small uh, encoded information or activation map, given the fact that I'm going to detect small objects. So for that reason, but here I have strong semantic information. If I have mentioned we are aggregating strong semantic information and features, so how to use both basically to have finer information as it is in earlier layers, shallower layers, and also strong semantic information. So what FPN proposed is just to have two ways, bottom up and top down. Once we reach the bottom up, uh, once we reach the last layer, we try to reconstruct the encoding information. But at the same time, uh, and we run three predictions, three set of predictions. So basically, in the last layer, I'm running predictions. And after reconstructing, upsampling the image, I'm again running predictions, and we do it three times. What, what is important to understand is that despite that we reconstruct the strong semantic information, we also, with lateral connections, uh, fuse the information from earlier days, uh, where I had information about edges, more fine, infor finer information, I am uh, fusing with strong semantic information, which is enabling us to detect small objects. So that is the concept of feature pyramid network, it's meta architecture, which is used in RetinaNet. Any questions so far? Uh, so this with the performance we've reached is feature pyramid networks. Uh, yeah. So, oh, ah, no, the whole method called name is RetinaNet, the arc RetinaNet, which is using the concept of feature feature pyramid network meta architecture. So you you might have a different backbone, you might have some. Uh, different as uh, heads, but the concept of this is uh, the feature pyramid network where you uh, reconstruct the information from sem strong semantic information fusing with uh, layers from earlier stages. So, yeah, uh, right, well, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so my question basically was that uh, in the right bottom uh, embedding uh, will basically, the whole meaning is that we'll basically have the information from the like really small objects as well as from the big objects or is... Yeah, so kind of? basically, yes. So, but, yeah. yeah. So, in this layer, what you guess, what we are going to take, smaller or larger objects? Uh, they're larger. Yeah, and here middle like and here middle. smaller. Yeah. Right, so... Uh, Yes, you can actually detect larger objects here as well, but usually what you do, you do anchor-based approach, and you place anchors, and here you replace larger ones, and here you replace smaller ones. Right, so yeah. combine them. Yeah, you, you combine them, yeah. At the end, of course, you combine them. Yeah. At the end, okay. you combine them, yeah. We're running by non-maximum suppression. Thank you. What we thought also in relation, we see it's done in six weeks, which was a very short time period, but what we could also think, maybe we just get rid of these two predictions because we are going to detect only a small objects. So, for example, in this part, we actually, what, what is bad here is that, I mean, 
like we run predictions at the earlier stages where we don't have information of strong semantic information like we have here. So there are some methods which are running predictions already from the beginning. Yeah. So yeah, we approached the weighted precision recall of 95 and 96% respectively. And uh, basically there is a backbone, we, throw, we throw, freeze the backbone and we train the head of a network. And uh, so, so what we've done also in the, we trained during the 11, first 11 epochs, we trained with original data and the rest up to 15th epoch, we trained with augmented data as well. And we've, show, we've seen that when we use augmented data directly from the beginning, this is how, how affect negatively on the performance. However, when we initially train with original data and then with augmented data, we find to with augmented data, it brings us performance improvement. So these are some examples. Uh, here you see with blue color, we have correct detections of cars, vehicles. The red rectangles are false positives, where there is no, well, maybe it's not, we don't, maybe here, for example. Red ones are detections where there is no car, but we think there is a detection, that network thinks there is a detection. And the yellow ones are the vehicles which are not detected by the network. Uh, yellow, can you see here? Yeah, here in this area. So, uh, I hope this video will work. Yeah, so this is, this is not real time working, frankly speaking, but just to see on the flow and video how it is performing. And you might see false positives as well here. And ventilation shafts also white. Why? Because in our yeah, here's the question. So you said it's not real time, but uh, what's the size of your model, and do you have any estimation if you want to apply it in a like in a real time application? How much delay you will you will have? You know, maximum some or something like that. Mm -hmm. No, I don't have it. It took about on on G, uh, RTX two seventy. It took about two seconds per frame. And you ask how is the potential to reduce it? Well, we didn't think about the real time working. With current our focus was the performance. So once in the new, uh, there will be students who will continue to work on this, and we reach, we see, we reach the best approach on the performance when we start to think about making it real time. So that's not our focus currently. But yeah, there are pretty way, a lot of ways to do this. But the strategy is what you usually do: you just reach the best performance you can, and when you start to shrink your network, uh, prune or quantize the parameters. About, yeah, two seconds on this GPU, yeah. This is a mobile on net notebook train, so it's not like the professional, uh, yeah. Okay, so have you tried optimizing it? No, uh, not for on time currently. Um, so what I, what just analysis, what we've seen in our training data set, we've seen a lot uh, white objects, so, uh, so in the majority of training data, we have white cars. We have cars which are dense, close together. We have cars, and that's why sometimes we, we have a lot of false positive on ventilation shafts. And also here, there is some shadows. It's not visible here, but color variation on the image, and it is next to a lane, road lane. So basically, and our network thinks that, that there is a detection here. Well, our assumption is that once we have lanes and there's some color variation, it is somehow hinting the network saying, hey, there is a car. Because majority of our training set, we have cars close to lanes. We have dense, we have detect cars where we have a lot. Our cars appear with 
our cars together. So if you don't majorly have separate cars in the field or on the road, you have a lot of cars. So somehow presence of a car, anything with network, there might be a car as well. In, in, I'll put it, uh, in other words, if there is one car on the road, this will reduce the confidence of a network that there is a car because there is no car surroundings. Because our network context information is full of cars close together. So what we are suggesting to do in the future, so basically we suggest as a future work to apply different augmentation techniques. So cut off, cut mix augmentation, you basically you take one image, you take another image, different. You crop a vehicle part or area of vehicles and place it in the other image. So that our network will be robust to environment. It won't perform detection based on the environment. And if you have problems of detecting soul cars, soul cars in the field, you might overcome this if you place, for example, your car crop, cropped car in some area where there is no car. And you run, so basically you create synthetic data to make your neural network robust to some environmental situations. Um, uh, to, we also suggest to apply artificial shadows on the image, create some synthetic data, and one also approach is to use key point detector. So basically not a bounding box around a key point which is going to cover the contour of a car. Because if a car is somehow diagonally, then you're going to place a bounding box over it, which is not optimal. And we also do, we do not detect trucks here because they're large on proportions. So that's why to use key point might overcome the issues. Of course, we need also to label that. Yeah, so GitHub Club. So if you are interested, feel free to apply. Students, supervisors. Well, I'm not officially representing GitHub Club, but I made this supervision through GitHub Club. And this is my context. Yeah, that's it. Questions? So uh, basically, I bumped into uh, this thing. I'm I'm not quite uh, like understanding, but I thought that like for optimizing the whole thing, maybe the quantization will help. Mm -hmm. I don't know uh, if you are familiar with that. Could you like explain why it can help, why it cannot help? Uh, well, of course, you, once you have a final results, I mean the best approach, quantization will help. Quantization is basically your um, imagine you have. So basically, the information of which kernel which I was showing uh, are so saved in float 32 bits. Yeah, so there were no integers or not in, in integer numbers. And for, for each number, uh, you need 32 bits or maybe 16 bits based on the equation. But once you have your results, once you know how your final uh, now weight parameters of your final network, you might Say you might uh, uh, sample your numbers to some specific range, which you can encode in with eight bits. Yeah, that's that's the thing. So once you know the range of your data, the range of the parameters, and the values of your weight, you might sample in that way so that you will have specific range which you can encode in eight bits instead of forty-two bits. So it's just like trying everything. You just need to like try and see which, uh, like, how much will you reduce to have, like, minimum loss yeah. of the accuracy? Yeah, you might do also, like, yeah, for example. I mean, is there, like, kind of formula or something to, like, determine what uh, percentage of redu reduction of the, like, weights will uh, cause the, like, minimum accuracy loss, or it's just, like, trying their thing? Uh, I cannot uh, say exactly, but I guess it's more trial or error. And also, there are some libraries, uh, uh, libraries which are doing it for you automatically. So basically, they also re reduce. You can also reduce also channels. So, for example, you have convolution filters of sequence. Each each layer has convolution filters, maybe from 128 from 64. So you, what you might do is like, if there are 64 layers, convolution filters, in each layer, that doesn't necessarily mean that each of us learns something. You might, there are some layers which 
will not bring anything, so you can prune those, just get rid of those. And this is more trial and error. So you just get rid of those, you calculate the L1 or L2 norm, and if you see based on a value, some threshold, you say this filter doesn't earn anything. So if I get rid of this, it will not have no impact on my performance, and you can do this trial and error, evaluate and see what can you do in order uh, to optimize, to reduce the number of channels, and also not to have a large loss in your accuracy. I see. Thank you. Yeah. And, and thank for you for the talk. Yeah. And for quantization, I guess there are some formulas which are one to one. So basically, we may not reduce the performance as much. But um, yeah, it's, yeah, it might be once we get a chance to talk, discuss yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. So probably. Um, you can also try the tensor RT techniques. Yeah. Uh, which is uh, which has really good tools for especially the convolutional ne neural networks uh, to optimize it and have much faster prediction. Tens tensor RT. Tensor RT, exactly. Yeah. So they are also, I guess, fusing some layers together. With, yeah, this is really amazing tool. I've never tried it on my own, but this is do this job automatically. It's automated. Uh, no, no. In general, uh, I mean, some layers are not supported, but uh, you can try it on different layers as well. Not on convolutional. So uh, I wanted to ask if you used any their pair processing uh, before uh, going before like inputting it to the neural no. network. No, we didn't do, use any pre processing. Maybe reducing the noise, reducing the shadows mm -hmm. would help much better mm -hmm. than uh, making the data more yeah. and feed it. So, so we have batch normalization layers. We had normalization also in the input, but with standard deviation, standard normalization, but we didn't do any like reducing shadows or use, I don't know, HSV, space, power space, we didn't do it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And uh, did you use a pre-trained retina net when you yeah. started the training? We used pre-trained, it was a pre the backbone was pre-trained on Coke satellite images, I guess, from Coco data set. Mm -hmm. And also you trained it with focal loss? Of yes. And yeah, it. basically, uh, focal loss is for classification, mm -hmm. but we have a task, a uh, one, one class actually. Mm -hmm. So somehow, uh, but we, we implemented that way, yeah. So I cannot talk about focal loss once we don't have classification task. But uh, there are the uh, once we have a second class, this will have an effect, I guess. Mm -hmm. But the focal loss is also one of the uh, uh, important uh, features of RetinaNet. Okay, thanks. <laughs>